Today's guest is the economist Tim Harford. Tim's a well-known media figure here in the UK. He's a best-selling author, newspaper columnist, podcaster, you name it. But for the longest time, he's been best known to me for his excellent BBC radio show, More or Less. And that's where our conversation started. What will people hear if they stumble over an episode of More or Less? It's going to be you talking to people about what? Yeah, me talking to people about numbers. That's the, that's the thing. But particularly about, uh, about statistics more often than, than pure maths, although... We had features about John Conway, for example, when he when he died. So we you know, we do talk about pure maths too. Mm. But the, your classic episode of more or less, it's nearly half an hour long, and we'll go through several numbers that have come up in recent days or recent weeks in the news, and we'll just interrogate them and say, well, is that true? And if it's not true, then then what is true? So it's, we're we're sort of a current affairs program. We're trying to understand the news. We're trying to understand the world, but we're trying to understand it through the lens of being rigorous about statistics, not super technical, but mm. just asking smart questions about where these numbers come from and, and what they mean. So sometimes you'll be like calling people out for sort of a misuse of the numbers or hang on, that's not exactly the way it seems and trying to set the record straight. The thing that we did a great deal of earlier this year was simply to examine the British government's record on testing because the British government was making a lot of promises about scaling up testing for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. And they said a lot of things that seemed a bit implausible and they measured their data in uh, pretty odd ways. And so we were just chasing them down and holding them to account. Like how many tests are they, are they actually carrying out? And how many people are they testing? Which is not the same thing because the same person could be tested many, many times. So that's, that's an example of a, of a news story, a current affairs story through the lens of numbers. We'll also have fun. So we did one about, um, there's a researcher in New Zealand who uh, works with parrots who are able to engage in statistical inference. So we talked to her about her parrots and about her experiments and how that all works. So it's, it's not all kind of hard news that we try and have a mix. So you've been doing this for a while now. Was it 13 years you told me you've been hosting the show for? Yeah, since 2007. And the, the show itself is nearly 20 years old. It was, um, it was uh, developed originally by Michael Blastland, who was a producer at the BBC, and Sir Andrew Dilnot, who is a pillar of the British establishment, a brilliant economist, um, now the head of Nuffield College, Oxford. So those two created this idea of like somebody needs to do a programme that is serious about numbers, data, statistics. And when they stopped in 2007, the BBC cast around for another economist, that was me, and so I've been presenting it ever since. And we've just gradually been broadening our empire into podcasting, onto the World Service, more repeats, more episodes. Uh, it's it's just become this um, this monster that I can no longer control. Any given week, there are numerous stories you guys are able to get your teeth into and talk about from, from the serious to the trivial. But can you think of any other time in 13 years where there's been a story where statistics and numbers have been a bigger deal than, than what's happening at the moment with COVID. For a while there, it seemed all anyone in the world were talking about were well, our numbers and graphs and curves. All of a sudden, it was like your moment had arrived. It's been very exciting. I mean, obviously, tragic, but statistics have felt incredibly important. There have been other examples. The financial crisis, we were trying to understand these huge numbers that were being thrown around in terms of well, LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, most important economic number in the world. What is that thing? How do we scale debt, deficit, GDP? And of course, we've fact-checked various elections, the Brexit referendum, and that's felt important. But I think, though, this is, this is the big one. And I think th the reason is, it's really, I hope, demonstrated to people how important numbers can be in, in actually understanding what's going on. So rather than, as, say, with an election campaign, where politicians are using numbers as a weapon... And the role of a show like More or Less is to say, well, hang on, that's maybe not true. During the pandemic, we've been scrambling around for good data. How many cases are there? How dangerous is this thing? What's the failure rate of the test? Or what's the specificity? What's the, what's the sensitivity? What is disappearing under the radar? What aren't we able to measure? Those clinical trials of these vaccine candidates, how are they working out? How seriously should we take them? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the things that people tend to have in their mind, I think unconsciously, is they imagine that numbers kind of, they come from some big spreadsheet somewhere. Some, some statistical god sticks them on the internet and you download them and that's the numbers. But of course the numbers are always being collected or collated 
by some person or some process, or maybe they're not being collected at all. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, they weren't being collected at all because no, this virus had not existed before. So I think people have started to understand sometimes the numbers just aren't there. And the scramble to get the numbers and to understand the numbers is incredibly important. I think you are the first economist that has been on the podcast. So I'm really curious to find out more about you and how you became an economist. So can we, can we quickly rewind to the early, early years? Where are you from, actually? Where were you born? And like... So I, I'm, I'm British and I moved around. So I was born in Kent. My parents moved up to near Manchester when I was four, then they, which is in the northwest. Then they moved over nearer to Sheffield in the sort of the north centre of England. Uh, and then when I was 12, moved down to Aylesbury, which is not far away from London. And so I've been, you know, I've been in the north, I've been in the south, I've been around the UK. Uh, my father was a computer programmer. And so moved with, with his job. Were you numbery? Would I have said that kid one day is going to be hosting more or less on the BBC? I, I was a bit of a nerd at school and I loved lots of different subjects. So you might have, if you were looking at me doing maths, you might have said, oh, this, this kid's into maths. I did a lot of role playing games. There's a lot of mental arithmetic involved in playing. Particularly, I played a game called Tunnels and Trolls, which involves rolling a lot of dice and adding up a lot of numbers. What kind of dice did you have? All those multi sided ones? Well, Tunnels and Trolls is just six sided, oh. but, you, but you roll buckets of them. You might roll 10 of them and then you quickly add them all up. Do you still have that skill? If I was to roll 10 dice now, are you able to like yeah. do a Rain Man and go? Yeah, 31? fairly, fairly fast. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say uh, savant, but fairly fast. Right. I, I really remember though, I was trying to design a big war game on a big board when I was, I don't know, probably about nine. Hmm. And the board was, uh, I think, 33 times 34. And I asked my primary school teacher, I said, Miss, I'm trying to figure out 33 times 34. And she said to me, because she's a primary school teacher, so she's not necessarily mathematically trained. Hmm. She said, what's 30 times 30? I said, it's 900. She said, well, what's three times four? I said, it's 12. And she said, well, what's, what's 33 times 34? And I said, uh, 912. But I knew there was something not quite right about that. Yeah. I didn't know the answer, but I knew that couldn't be right. And I went home and I told my mum. My mum studied for a doctorate in biochemistry. So my mum knew her numbers. She was outraged. Right. <laughs> but the, what she did, rather than phoning the school to complain about the teacher, which of course is pointless, she sat me down with a big piece of paper and she, she showed me and she drew out these two, uh, the big square, the little square. I'm sure number file listeners can picture it now. The big square, the little square, and the two long thin strips. And you've got to add the three times the 30 and the four times the 30. And that gives you 33 times 34. And I remember another time she explained some probability to me. And again, it was how likely is the Balrog to kill you if you cross the bridge? And it was, all, no, it was like 50% plus 50%. Is 100%. She's like, no, no, it's 50% times 50%, which is 25%. And so I remember my, my mother actually talking me through a lot of this stuff mm. and, and being engaged by that. And, and of course, it's always more engaging. Well, it's probably not true for everybody. But for me, I was not interested in maths for its own sake, but I was totally comfortable with maths as a tool to help me play games or do anything else I was trying to do. What did you want to be when you grew up at that point? Probably a troll or something. Oh, yeah, I wanted to be a game designer. <laughs> right. I, wanted, yeah. I wanted to write uh, role-playing games and board games and maybe fantasy novels like Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And later on, I didn't know. So in the UK, at the age of 16, you have to really specialise and you're encouraged to either go arts or sciences and just do maybe three or four subjects. It's a very annoying fact about British education. I, in the end, did maths, physics, more maths, and English literature, okay. and, and a little bit of French. And so that was that sense of, oh, I'm, not, I'm not turning my back on, on the arts. Hmm. And then at university, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And in the end, I thought maybe law, but fortunately, someone persuaded me that that was a dumb idea. So in the end, I did a degree called uh, PPE, Philosophy, Politics and Economics. And again, it's just this classic example of this is a degree for someone who doesn't know what he wants to do. Okay. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was just keeping my options open. And got, economics has got numbers. Philosophy, I thought, was the thing that was really interesting. That's essays like English literature. Hmm. And I didn't really know about politics. Um, so, but clearly at this point, you've, you've ruled out nuclear physicist and doctor and things like that. Yeah, I have. Well, I spent... I, Gave up biology when I was 12, so I guess a uh, doctor was probably always... In the science lessons, I didn't like to um, like touch the worms or stuff like that. So I, I'd have been a bad doctor. Yeah. Um, physics, 
sort of very interested in physics, mm. but uh, and my dad studied physics. But no, in the end, I was just trying to keep my options open as much as possible. And of course, it, in that process of trying to keep your options open, inevitably, there are certain options that are closing. What, so you've got no idea. I mean, I'm going to say what you're going to be when you grow up. You almost are grown up now. You've still got no idea what you're going to do. You, you, everything's on the table. No, I, yeah, I, I still had no idea. And I think in retrospect, I was really interested in writing. And right. of course, I later became a writer. So I wasn't a member of a student newspaper or anything like that. I didn't have any journalistic training. But I did, going back to the role-playing games, have a fanzine at school that I would use a, use primitive desktop publishing software. This is in the late 1980s. Put together articles about role-playing games, edit the whole thing, edit my friend's essays, put it all together. When I look back, I think you were interested not just in playing games, but in writing about the games Communication. That you played. Communication, yeah. So... What did your computer programmer father and science-focused mother think at this point when you were like in university doing philosophy and politics and economics and saying, I don't really know what I want to do? What are they saying to you? Uh, Well, they were always fairly hands-off. So the other thing that I was doing a lot of was public speaking, debating, and and I won quite a few school competitions so that's a, that's another strand of, of communication but you know it was, it was a different time so this is the late 80s early 90s I had three younger siblings my, my father wasn't very well when I was about 17 my mother became terminally ill a little bit later when I was about 20 so I had other things to think about so I don't think they were that worried I'd gone off to Oxford University. It's a great university. I was so, so you're, not the, and, you're not the black sheep of the family. You know, I was in a very, I think, in a very privileged position, and I think they had they had other things to think about. How did economics become the thing then? So I think I was very lucky. I was interested in philosophy. I wasn't particularly interested in economics. I didn't take a lot of the early economics classes that seriously. I mean, if I found them interesting, I'd get stuck in. But I had it in my mind that I would quit economics at the end of the first year. And and there's an interesting, to me, insight into the way you can get yourself stuck in a particular way of thinking and not really take on board new information that you should be taking on board. And the information I should have been taking on board is, oh, you actually like economics, you're good at economics. And the fact that you came into this subject assuming you would drop it, you probably need to rethink that. And I was very fortunate at the end of my first year, when it was all still up in the air, one of my economics teachers, a a man called Peter Sinclair, wrote to me a handwritten letter and said, you know, you should take this seriously. I think you shouldn't quit. I urge you to keep going with the subject. I'm very lucky that I had people like Peter to guide me through that and to encourage me to play to to my strengths. I'm sad to say Peter Peter died of COVID earlier this year. So it was a um, quite a loss because this is this is the guy who's the reason I became an economist and I love being an economist so yeah I felt lucky if you were the guy who wasn't taking economics seriously what did he see in you that made him write that letter well I think I I like bits of it but nevertheless I was planning to stop the two big chunks of economics basically are microeconomics which is about how individuals behave, how firms behave. There's quite a lot of of engineering maths in it, but there's also potentially psychology in it and and questions like that. There's a lot of game theory in it. I would love game theory. There's macroeconomics, which is about how the entire economy behaves, which I found quite confusing. And so I thought, well, it doesn't matter because I'll be able to drop all this. So if I went out into a normal street anywhere in the UK and I said to someone, economics, what's economics? What do you think they, they would say? So economics doesn't have a a really encouraging uh, reputation at the moment. I think if you'd asked that question 20 years ago, most people would have said, oh, it's some stuff about interest rates and stock markets. Money. Which, yeah, money. Yeah, money often. I mean, money's really interesting, but money is more history and anthropology than economics. It doesn't have such a major role in economics for some... Well, we could discuss that if you like. But, um, you know, it's about money. It's about markets. Whereas I would say, no, no, it's about the decisions all of us make every day. We are surrounded by an incredibly complex economy. There are maybe 10 billion distinct products and services on sale. It's about how we spend our time and how we're rewarded for spending our time and inequality, who gets what and why they get it, regulating pollution, uh, congestion, uh, building. I mean, there's so, and, and all of these different aspects of human behavior. So there's maths, there's history, there's psychology, there's sociology. That's what economics is to me. But to most people, I think 20 years ago, they'd have said, oh, it's about money. 15 years ago, they might have said, oh, it's about that cool new free economics book that was briefly made economics cool. And 10 years ago, they would have said, oh, it's about greedy bankers and economists not being able to see 
the great financial crisis coming. So we've been recovering from that reputational hit uh, ever since, which I think is, um, I would say, is about 25% deserved and about 75% undeserved. So after that letter from Peter, that obviously persuaded you and, and changed your thinking, what did you think you were going to do then? Once economics took over and it became this thing that you focused on, what did you think you were going to do? Did you think you were going to work for a bank or did you think you were going to be this like, you know, trendy economist that cares about people and motivation? And- oh, I still didn't know. I was completely clueless. I really was clueless. And uh, I was loving my studies. I was loving being a, an undergraduate. I was still playing games. And one day I bumped into, of all people, Peter Sinclair at a bus stop. He had moved on. He was a professor at Birmingham by then. He was in Oxford, bumped into him on the street, and he said, I know what you should do when you finish. You should go to Ireland. You could teach economics at University College Cork in Ireland for a year. I've got a relationship with them, and they're looking for someone for a year, and would you like to do it? And I thought, yeah, that sounds okay. So off I, you can see Peter played a big role in my this life. This is your fairy godfather. Yeah, it really, really was. I mean, they have, they have, I've been very lucky. There have been other yeah. fairy godfathers and fairy godmothers since, but So Peter sent me off to Ireland for a year. And again, I was surrounded by these mentor figures. I was 22 years old. Some of my students were older than I was. I'm teaching them what I know based on what I've just studied at Oxford. I'm increasingly interested in the teaching, the communication, trying to get these ideas out there. I'm having fun. And so I decided I had a corporate job offer to go and work for for the oil company Shell. And I thought, actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go and go back to Oxford, do a master's degree, get more into this. What did Shell want you to do? What would you have been doing if you'd gone down that path? So there was something they wanted me to do that actually I think would have been very boring. But I did do something at Shell. I kept a relationship with them for a few years, um, like summer internships, a bit of consulting, things like that. And what I did in that time, this is before, during and after my master's degree, Hmm. was to work in their scenario planning department. And that is a very, very interesting place. Yeah. So the scenarios department of Shell, it's got a, a reputation that goes way back. The story that they tell is that they saw the oil shocks of the 1970s coming and that saved Shell a lot of money. And that made the reputation of the scenarios team for life. But the thing about scenarios is it's not a straightforward forecast of, oh, we plugged some numbers in and here's, here's the graph. It's a much more qualitative approach. Mm. So you've got political scientists, you've got sociologists, historians, you've got technology experts, and you're all gathered around and you're talking to the experts in a particular field. You're trying to say, well, what's going to happen to Brazil over the next 10 years? Or what's going to happen to um, hydrogen-powered car technology over the next 50 years? It sounds awesome. So interesting. Yeah. I had a love-hate relationship with the job because I'm working for a big multinational and with all of that imp- implies, but so interesting, such in you know, such fascinating people. For a guy that likes fantasy games and stuff as well, like you're using the world as your fantasy game. And again, I'm starting to tell stories because the way the scenarios would work, I mean, the perfect scenario exercise ends up with somebody telling you a story about the future. It's almost like sci-fi that's completely compelling. And because it's a good story, all these complex things go into your head and they stick. And you're like, oh yeah, I can really see this future. I really understand how solar power is going to turn the hydrocarbon industry on its head. I've got it. I've totally got it. And then at the end of the story, you say, but actually that's not what's going to happen. And then you tell a totally different, totally contradictory story that ideally is equally plausible, equally coherent, equally memorable. And then what you've given people is two visions of the future, two ways to understand the way the world might evolve. You've got them to understand that we don't know. And you, you're synthesizing not just, you know, here's the data, here's the, here are the economic ideas, oh, but here's what this... Um, anthropologist who's lived lived in Nigeria for the last 20 years, here's what he told me. Here's what this expert in the Chinese political transition, here's what she told me. You mix them all together. So there's more and more of this communication coming together. And I'm still noodling along and I still don't know what I'm going to do with my life. (laughs) And then one of the people I met, so I met two really important people at Shell. One was my wife-to-be, who's an environmentalist who was busy trying to figure out how to get them to clean up their act. Um, It was an interesting thing to try to do. But the other person I met was a science writer called David Badanis. He was just briefly in Shell to talk to us about the future of technology. David is, I think, most famous for a book called E equals MC squared, which is a great book about the history of, of all the different ideas in that equation and the people behind those ideas. So like, who came up with equals? Who first put that the C to represent the speed of light? All of this stuff. And I was having coffee with him and we were talking about this, this scenario work. And I said to him... I would really love to write a book about economics that's 
like E equals MC squared is about physics. And he looked at me and he said, well, and that was about it. And he sort of raised his eyebrow and, yeah, do it. yeah what's, what's stopping you? You don't need anyone's permission. And so I started working on it part time in, in and around other projects that I was doing. Hmm. And that very, very slowly became the undercover economist. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't have any reason to believe. I didn't know how to write a book. Didn't have any reason to believe anybody would ever read this thing. But I remember finishing the first draft and, and coming downstairs and, and telling my wife, who was by then my wife, uh, I've finished it. And if no one ever reads it, it's okay because I really enjoyed writing it. Right. I think it's now sold nearly 2 million copies around oh, the world. Oh, really? Wow. So, so, yeah, I was lucky. Very, very lucky. Good decision. Cool name for a book, too. Yeah, it took, and of course, uh, like with all of these things, it takes a while to think yeah. about what, what the name should really be. Were you writing it because you thought it would make you money? Were you writing it, oh, because, no. were you no, writing no, no. it because you enjoyed writing or were you writing it because you've got this sort of zeal for the world to understand economics and love it the way you do? I, I just, yeah, I just, I do love economics. I find it fascinating. I would be going around seeing things in the world and saying, oh, that's like, that's the economics that I got taught and, and there it is in action and I, I want to tell somebody about that. So it was that urge to communicate. Never for a moment any thought that I would make any money. I, as I said, I didn't even know that anyone would ever publish the book. You needed a YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, so this would have been, when was YouTube? When, 2006 YouTube? I forget. Oh, it's around there. So, yeah. so I started writing this book in 2001 yeah. and wrote most of it 2002 and finally found a publisher 2005. Okay. So, I mean, it's not exactly JK Rowling's story of constant rejection, but it took a while. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's all pre-YouTube. So yeah, I mean, people do you know, email me and say, oh, um, could you tell me how you got into writing? Because I want to get into writing. And, yeah. I, and I try to be encouraging. But I also say, I don't think what I did is necessarily what I would advise someone to do now because everything about the world has changed. And people do have ways through blogging platforms, through YouTube, podcasting. There are so many ways to get your ideas out there. I mean, there's no guarantee. It's a very noisy world. but So... You've obviously, you know, written this book. You've written a new book, which we'll talk about talk about later. You've obviously got this really successful radio show, and you do all these all these other bits and pieces. Do you have have you had a full time job as an economist, or have you kind of since since becoming an economist have you never actually been an economist? I've never been an economist. So um, I do have a day job, which is actually being a columnist for the Financial Times. That is my day job, but right. that, but of course that is not being an economist either. No. So have, yes, so I was. Um, for one year, a lecturer in economics at, at University College Cork. Yep. That is t- definitely a proper economist. Okay. I was for about three months a management consultant. That did not go very well. Right. Uh, one of my colleagues said, all you need to be able to do to be good at this job, Tim, is talk crap and wear a suit. Yeah. You can't do either of those things. Right. So um, <laughs> that, no, that, was, that was a bad job. But... Um, I guess the work I was doing for Shell, which was kind of was was on and off, but for a while was for a year or, or more was was nearly full time. Yeah, I would say that was I yeah, was I was an economist. My boss was the chief economist of Shell. And I don't have a PhD in economics. I've never been a, a, a proper academic economist. Hmm. And I have a lot of respect for academics and for and for other economic professionals who really take those skills to the next level. A lot of what you do in your writing, your, your, your books, including your new book, your radio show, is about creating a more numerate society, a society in which we all understand numbers better. How important is that? Because I, I mean, I kind of do it too, right? So I'm not, like, I'm not attacking the, the idea, but how important is it that people have a really good understanding of numbers? I drove here today to your house in a car. Yeah. I don't know how cars work. No, no. And when the car stops working... I get someone who understands cars to fix it. You know, I can only hold so much in my head. Why does society as a whole have to be numerate? There's a certain minimum level of numeracy that is it's just important for people's quality of life. Just not being ripped off by, say, a credit card company or a, uh, somebody selling you a, a car or finan- you know, a, a financial product attached to a car. Mm. So th- there's that. You need that a certain de- degree of numeracy. But beyond that, I think, as, as with anything... What I'm really arguing for is for people to be curious about the world, ask good questions, have a little bit of confidence in themselves to apply some common sense and to just sort of stop and and ask themselves what is really 
going on here? What is the story? What's happening? Of course, the more mathematical nous you have, the better. But you can have all the technical mathematical skills in the world, and that's not going to save you from making uh, mistakes. Actually, the, one of the opening stories in the new book is actually about one of the world's leading art experts being fooled by a forger with a bad forgery. Right. And it's it's like a multi-million dollar fiasco. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible mistake. And this guy is the top man on the work of Rembrandt and Vermeer. And this is nothing to do with statistics. The point I'm making is he is the world's best expert. And he made this mistake. And he made this mistake because of his emotional reaction to the forgery that he was being shown and how he felt about it and how it kind of justified the stories he told himself about Johannes Vermeer and what Johannes Vermeer had done. My point is, you can have all the technical, statistical and mathematical expertise you like, you're still going to fall foul of tricksters, you're still going to fool yourself if you want to, if you're, you know, if you're politically motivated or if you're emotionally motivated in the way you're reaching conclusions. So the argument I'm making both in my economics books and in the, the writing about statistics and the broadcasting is, you can think for yourself if you're willing to be reasonably disciplined and if you're willing to play it fairly cool and not be motivated by sort of anger and self-righteousness so we have like an education system in this country which i don't know you could argue it's good or bad i I think it's probably pretty good uh most people go through it we have a a a big and vibrant media in the country the bbc and other organizations what is wrong with those systems that results in you being able to sustain such a successful career. Like, what, why, why are there so many people out there that need to be to read these books and be listen to more or less to figure things out? Is is something broken, or is it? Just, is so, it, if I'm the symptom, what's the disease? Is what you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, You're, lot, oh, no, you can be the cure. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I try to be the cure, but uh, it's not it's not always totally straightforward. A lot of the conclusions we reach, we reach because we're social animals. So we believe things because people we like or trust or want to be in with believe them. So you can see it right now with, with mask wearing. Now we wear masks because people like us wear masks or we refuse to wear masks because people like us are refusing to wear masks. Not many people are really sitting down with the randomised trials of masks. By the way, there aren't very many randomised trials of masks. It's a social thing. And, and that's true for a lot of what we believe. Um, and to be honest, if, if you're going to get all evolutionary psychology about it, it kind of makes sense. It's, your views on climate change are not actually going to change the climate because you're just one person out of seven and a half billion people. Like, it doesn't matter what you think about climate change. The climate's changing. But what you think about climate change is really going to affect you know, who will be friends with you, who will take you seriously, who will shout at you on the internet. And whether you live in, say, Nebraska or sort of Brighton in the south of England the kind of people around you are going to have very different views on on these things. So we're guided by the social world around us. And so it's natural that people will leap to conclusions that may be fallacious. And that's why a lot of what I'm arguing is is about emotional literacy and understanding your own reaction as much as it is about technical skills. So there's, it's not like, you know, we could improve the school curriculum or journalists could do a better job. It's really you, you're saying, look, everyone, you just need to take a deep breath and have a bit more of a think about this. We could improve the school curriculum and journalists could do a better job. But also, it's never a bad idea to take a deep breath. Uh, so... Uh, let me give you an example. So there's some research on, on fake news. And there's a big moral panic about fake news that uh, I think is not necessarily very productive. Where I'm just trying to recall the gist of the research, but they basically would show people claims like 500 people were just interdicted on the US-Mexican border all wearing suicide vests, which is your sort of classic kind of far-right fake news story. And you show this to... If you show it to Democrats, it's like, well, that's nonsense. Show it to Trump supporters... And you would ask, do you think this is true? And they would say, no, that's probably not true. And you say, do you think it's important not to share stuff on the internet that's false? And they would say, yeah, no, I don't want to just share lies on the internet. But that's when you're getting them to stop and think. What actually happens is Trump supporters see that claim and they retweet it because it just fits in the story. If you got them to stop and think, they'd go, oh, yeah, that's nonsense, isn't it? I don't want to share that with my friends. And I don't want to pick out Trump supporters. This is true. We're all... We all got our biases, we've all got our sort of social groupings, and we've all got our emotional reactions, but we just need to sort of s- to slow down. And, and when people slow down, they're smarter than we think. Let me give you a, a quick example from my, my own experience. So I remember seeing a graph on Twitter years ago now, 
that was showing uh, rapid liberalisation of people's view uh, on gay marriage. Uh, I'm very much in favour of people's right to marry, regardless of the sexual orientation. So for me, this is really good news. And I just retweeted it. Boom, great news. Look, people are, people are thinking the right things like I think. And then the first reply underneath it was, Tim, have you looked at the axes on that graph? And I just thought, oh no. <laughs> and the graph, it was from the Washington Post, so it wasn't like it was some nonsense, but the the axes were really dodgy. They're basically sort of compressed together. You know, sometimes it was decades between the question being asked and then sometimes it was just a few years and it, was, it wasn't a good graph. I should have clipped it and kept it for my bad data visualization folder. Right. But instead, I was retweeting it to, to tens of thousands of people. Oh, everyone have a look at this. And that's just an example of that emotional reaction. Do you often find yourself not practicing what you preach, like in the, you know, in the heat of the moment or... Do you see yourself as a human in that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I see myself as a human? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So look, the more I've thought about it, the more conscious I think I've become of my own behaviour and the more I'm able to police my own biases. But it's, you know, you're never going to be 100% successful. It's about damage control. I'm just trying to behave in a better way, trying to think more clearly, trying to be more calm. And that comes with with time. But of course, I, I make loads of mistakes. And hopefully I make interesting mistakes. I love making interesting mistakes on the radio. But mistakes like just retweeting something that's nonsense, you know, I'd I'd rather not make that kind of mistake. I can imagine the sort of audience and community that congregates around a person like you is not the sort of audience that it's fun to make a mistake in front of. Or you don't get away with many mistakes. No, you don't get away with a lot. And, (laughs) uh, And But yeah, I mean, mistakes can be really instructive and useful i mean sometimes it's just like oh yeah we talked to somebody and she she said something that wasn't right and that was a month ago and that's good now we're off air and someone wants a correction and what do we get you know sometimes it's just you don't want to make mistakes but some mistakes are really fun have you ever had one where your blood's just run cold and it's like oh that was a bad mistake and you've just watched it go out into the universe oh well it's actually the one the worst one for me the beginning of one of my books messy tells a story about um a jazz concert performed by keith jarrett and then i gave a ted talk about that idea and what that idea teaches us and what that incident teaches us and i think six million no it must be four million four million anyway a lot of people seen the ted talk and then it went out on npr and then someone emailed me and said I used to believe your stuff. I used to like your stuff, but you got that story completely wrong. And I, now I can't trust what you say anymore. And I just thought, oh, what have I done? You know, I'm sure. But I did, it was years ago that I first researched that story. And I just went and I dug all the way through all my sources. And I dug through the sources of the person who'd sent me this. Hmm. And I listened and I was like, no, 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 I got it right. I got it right. I got it right. And I listened to what she had sent me. And what she had sent me was also completely in support of what I'd said. And I, and I wrote back and I said, I think I was right. If you listen to the thing you just sent me, I think it completely backs up what I said. Right. And about two days later, she wrote back and said, oh, yeah, you're right. I thought, oh, thanks. <laughs> this is a way to ruin someone's day. Sometimes I should just be more like, I don't care. Um, but I can tell you a fun one about, so that, that was a mistake that wasn't a mistake. No, that's fine. It's good. But, but let, me, <laughs> let me tell you about, uh, think about being a journalist is you, you say a lot of stuff all the time with hundreds of thousands of eyes on you. Yeah. And so, of course, you make mistakes. Hmm. But a fun one was fans of Kate Bush may know that Kate Bush has a song, I think called Pie. It's certainly about Pie. And in the background of the song, she sings the first 150 digits of the decimal expansion of Pie. And it turns out that one of them's wrong. In fact, to be more precise, one of them's missing. And I'm pretty sure that some producer at some stage just edited it out because she hit a bum note, I'm guessing. Yeah. Anyway, the wrong number's in there. So we had a whole item on more or less about mathematical mistakes in music like paul simon uh two times two is 22 four times four is 44 when numbers get serious they leave a mark on your door we had lots of fun and then i said well since the decimal expansion of pi is infinite at some stage that sequence of numbers that kate bush sang is in there right and then a mathematician wrote and said ah no that's not true well, it's not necessarily true. It's not proven. Yeah. And this was completely news to me. He said, pi needs to be a, a normal number, not in the sort of the statistical sense. I usually think of a normal distribution, but it needs to be a normal number. And a normal number, as uh, listeners may know, is, well, every digit is equally likely to be in the decimal expansion. Every digit is equally likely to be zero to nine. Every pair of digits is equally likely to be zero to 99. Every trio is equally likely to be zero to 999, etc. That's the definition of a normal number. And it turns out that 100% 
of all numbers are normal. You can prove that. Like if you just drop a point on the number line anywhere, the real numbers, 100% of them are normal. But that doesn't mean all of them are normal. It just means that if you randomly choose one, it'll be normal. Yeah. We know that some are not normal. We don't know whether pi is normal or not. And so this is an unproven conjecture. But we now have a corollary. The corollary is the Kate Bush conjecture, which is that the numbers that she sings on are in fact in the decimal expansion of pi. And if anybody ever proves that pi is normal, then that corollary will be proven. None of that I knew the slightest bit about when mm. I just offhandedly made the statement. And so that's the kind of mistake that's really, really fun. Yeah. Because, because coming back to the point I was making about politics, there's no political axe to grind there. No one's trying to prove anybody wrong. Mm. It's just we're all exploring this wonderful world of mathematics together and having fun and learning stuff. And that, that's why I think that was an interesting and, and illustrative and fun mistake to make. You should have pulled a Fermat and said, I've actually proven that pi is normal. I just, I just can't fit the proof in this email. <laughs> totally should have done. So tell me about the book then. <laughs> if I read this book, what am I going to find out that I didn't know before? So the book is called How to Make the World Add Up. Hmm. Ten Rules for Thinking Differently About Numbers. Hmm. And the basic message of the book is statistics can help you think more clearly about the world. They can help you understand what's going on, what's going on when you read the news, what's going on around you, the claims that your friends are making on social media. You can understand the world better. But that's not just about the technical skills of understanding how statistics work. It's also about the psychological and emotional skills of being able to change your mind, not having your conclusions predetermined by your political biases. So it's as much psychology as it is statistics. And those two things together, I, I think, are what you need to see the world more clearly. And the book's got 10 chapters, 10 kind of rules of thumb that I've picked up over the, over the years. I wouldn't say there were 10 commandments, but the 10 things that I found useful yeah. working on more or less. And then there's finally the golden rule. And the golden rule is be curious, be willing to ask the extra question, be willing to be open-minded, to entertain the possibility that you're wrong, to entertain the possibility that there's something about the world that you don't know. And it, it has a, a wonderful effect, an approval effect at neutralising to some extent political biases. So if you, you're thinking as a, as a Tory or Labour, you're thinking as a Republican or Democrat, you just reject certain things out of hand. But it's been demonstrated that naturally curious people are just more they're like, oh, that's something I didn't expect to see tell me more, rather than that's something I didn't expect to see, can't be right. So curiosity is this, this solvent that dissolves political tribalism. But of course, it's just a, gr it's a great way to motivate yourself to, to find out more. And the great communicators, we've talked a lot about communication in our conversation, the great scientific communicators, the great communicators you talk to on Numberphile, it's not about just explaining stuff really clearly or not using jargon. It's about creating that sense that the world is a wonderful place and wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to find out more about it? And that's what, the, that's what the great communicators have in common. And that's what I'm trying to instill in listeners to my radio show and in readers of the book. How much can we rely on numbers and statistics and mathematics to sort of save us and be this kind of underpinning of all the decisions and things we make you listen to podcasts and organizations like 538 and that we've got this whole sort of breed it's people like yourself to some extent as well this wave of communicators who are like really rational and think let's look let's stop let's look at the numbers and make our decisions based on that but surely there's got to be a whole swathe of things that can't be decided in that way and in the end it is like instinct or your heart or morals and things like that you talked about you know you, your support that everyone should be able to get married no, no number or statistics ever going to tell us whether that's right or wrong. That's yeah. just something you believe because you believe. Yeah. I mean, the, one could gather data, for example, on, say, the, um, the life chances of children of gay couples, for example. You can do that. People have hmm. done that. That would provide information. But you, I think you're right. It ties into what I was saying about curiosity. So there are certain things that you know, the numbers will only take you so far. So what, what happens? Is the number, is the data, the algorithm the equation, is that the point at which you stop asking questions? Or is that the tool that helps you keep asking better questions? If it's the point at which you stop asking questions, you look at the New York Times prediction that Hillary Clinton is 99% likely to win the 2016 election. Yeah, if that's the point at which you go, all right, I don't need to think about this anymore, then, you know, you've got a problem. 
But if the whole process is going, well, what is it that we don't know? What is it that we don't understand? What's really going on here? Um, if that's what the numbers are doing for you, if they're feeding into that process of curiosity, I think they're tremendously powerful. Your book is here next to me, the hard copy of it. You only just got it, haven't you? In print, only just in the last few days or something. Is yeah, it? So yeah. We're, we're talking in in August, a few weeks before yeah. publication on the seventeenth of September, and it literally arrived on my door yesterday. What's that like when when it's you can't change it anymore? It's like a hard copy. It could have a mistake in there. People could not like it. Yeah, it will like, have a mistake in there. Yeah. yeah like, wh- what does that feel like? Um, it's nerve wracking. I, I tell you, something I haven't done with any book before, but I'm doing for this one is I'm doing an audiobook. We're speaking on Wednesday, so in two days' time, I begin recording the audiobook, and I'm terrified of that because I know that when I actually sit down and read every single word of this book out loud, I am going to find something. Maybe not a mistake, there probably will be mistakes, but there's certainly be something I just think, oh, I can't believe I wrote that clunky sentence. I can't believe I expressed it like that. But at a certain point, you've got to, you can't be working and reworking, reworking the book. You've got to put it out there and, and uh, take it on the chin. One thing I did do, the book was just about to go to the publishers and then lockdown hit. Mm. Due date was uh, end of March. And I, and I said, on about the 25th of March, I said to my publishers, hang on a minute, we can't stop here. No. I've got to say something about what's going on. And the suggestion was, oh, well, why don't we add a preface later? We'll add like four page preface or an eight page preface where you reflect on the pandemic and we can put that in really late. Mm. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to rewrite the book, not completely rewrite the book, but I want to go through the book and I want to talk about what's happening with the pandemic because there are so many examples in the book where the pandemic is is absolutely the best, the very best example of what it was I was saying all along. Hmm. So actually the book is full of references to the pandemic that are just, it was, it was actually so easy to rewrite because I thought, yes, this is, um, I'm sad to say, but everything I was arguing all along, the pandemic has really underlined it and, and put it into sharp relief. I mean, it completely turned my views of the world upside down in many ways but one thing it did not do was change my views about statistics and statistical communication I I thought to myself I'm afraid sadly that I was right about that being someone who's so aware and immersed in statistics and reading about medical trials and numbers and probabilities and that do you think it makes it easier or more difficult being someone who's you know, going shopping at Tesco and going to the pub and walking around with all this knowledge in your head about R numbers and spread and risk and safety and that. Do you think it? Do you think it makes it nicer walking around the world with that in your head, or it makes you more paranoid? Or so as we speak, fortunately, there isn't a lot of infection in the community in the UK. It's not quite clear exactly how much there is, but there's not that much. So we've got to be really careful to keep it that way. So I personally am careful not to spread the virus when I go around, but I'm not worried that I'm going to catch it because that is not very likely. I'm just, you know, I just want to make sure that like everybody else, we all do our bit. What I really remember very clearly is a few days before lockdown, I realised just what was coming. And I was kicking myself because I felt I should have known in mid-February because I was talking to the epidemiologist in mid-February. I had all the technical information I needed in mid-February to see that this was going to be awful. But as I argue in the book, it can be hard to emotionally register the facts. And so it took me a little while. And I think I should have been a month ahead of most people. And I think I was about three days ahead of most people. (laughs) But in that three days, I remember walking down the street and I was shaking. I was physically shaking. And it was not out of fear of the virus. I'm I'm 47. It's not, the risk to me is not that high. But because I knew what was going to happen to the country, what was going to happen to the economy, I knew it was going to be awful. I remember walking down the street and thinking, I don't think you you all realise what's happening. And it really was two or three days. And then everyone else was like, oh, and then there was no more toilet paper. So um, so that was that was that one brief moment where I thought, yeah, that knowing the numbers changed my changed the experience of walking around my hometown. It really should have changed me the experience a month previously. It was so interesting that it was so I was emotionally slow, so slow to register the facts that I had at my disposal. But that that is precisely the argument that I'm making in the book. When we come out the other side of this, but hopefully there is another side, another yeah. side of this. Yeah, well, you, Oxford, where we're sitting, they're working hard on a vaccine. Yes. You know, fingers crossed. Good, please, please. Do you think we're going to come out with a more numerate society as a result? A society that now can read a graph? I think we are, actually. I think people have become much more interested. 
uh, in the numbers. The most popular page on the Financial Times in Financial Times history is the coronavirus tracker put together by my colleagues led by John Byrne Murdoch. Really good, clear, free to read uh, tracking of all kinds of things that you might want to know. And there's never been a page on the FT website that has got so much interest. And of course, there are many other examples out there. So yeah, I think it is generating a renewed respect not a universal respect, but a renewed respect for expertise, a renewed respect for science, a renewed respect for numbers. Sadly, it's a very high price to pay, but I think that, that is what's happening. All right. Well, finally, what's next for you after you finish publicising this book and trying to get every man, woman and their dog to buy it? And, and that finally is over. There will be a link in the show notes, people, to go and buy it. What, what are you going to do after this? You've got another book, TV show, YouTube channel, movie? So real, uh, real economics job. Oh, who knows? Maybe, maybe get me back on number file. That would be nice. Yeah, oh, um, you're, you're welcome anytime. Thank you. And lastly, last question, maybe last question. Do you still play games? Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the fun things about lockdown, one of the few silver linings to this terrible cloud has been playing more games, realising that you can do theatre of the mind brilliantly over Discord playing really great games with with people I don't see often enough and also that there are uh, websites like dominion.games and board game arena where you can play board games uh, online and um, they've existed for ages but I've only just stumbled uh, upon them what's your real game of choice at the moment then uh, so I've made up my own role-playing game for the role-playing game so it's a really super stripped down version of GURPS there's going to be nothing to 99% of the people who listen to this but it's like a two-page version of GURPS and it's inspired by Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea trilogy and for board games at the moment I can't get enough of Dominion which is a very very varied game lots and lots of different combinations lots of different possibilities all right well I'll I'll let you get back to it then (laughs) thank you very much Brady (laughs) thanks to Tim for taking the time to chat you can also see him in a recent video on the Numberphile YouTube channel his latest book How to Make the World Add Up is available to order and I'm also going to include a special link for signed copies check out the show notes for that as well as links to Tim's other work my name's Brady Harron and you've been listening to the Numberphile podcast we'll be back again soon <laughs>